Hello, everybody. I'm going to do something uh, kind of juvenile here. Take a selfie. Please say hello to my mother. <laughs> awesome. There, just one more. OK. Hi. It's a little loud. I'm a textile artist most widely known for starting the yarn bombing movement. This is a perfect example of what that is. Yarn bombing, in a nutshell, is when you take knitted or crocheted material out into the urban environment, graffiti style. Uh, sorry, I didn't have needle. I didn't have a spray can. I had needles and yarn. This is the very first piece I did. I actually named it. It's called Alpha. I named it because this piece was extremely significant in my life. It literally changed the course of my life. From this piece, I wrapped stop sign poles and uh, fire hydrants and park benches and anything that I could get my hands on in the urban environment. And I did this because I was getting such a cool reaction that it was uh, seductive in a way. And so I continued to do it and ultimately, ultimately what happened is it started a movement that is now globally recognized. So I clearly took my own unique set of skills out into street art, naively, meaning that I wasn't aware of the set of rules or the status quo out there. I observed that this niche market was male dominated and I was a woman bringing this craft that is female dominated. So in a way, this was my own form of feminism. I looked at the world a little differently and happened to turn some heads while doing it. <laughs> I had this unique perception of everyday things that, meaning that I literally photoshopped knitting on anything that struck a chord with me, from a statue in Bali, to a bus in Penang, to a double-decker bus in London. So, I think all of us can recognize that we don't really talk to strangers. We've been told since we were children that we don't talk to strangers. Strangers are bad. So, I find it kind of humorous that one of my favorite things about my work is talking to strangers, strangers that come up to me and ask me what I'm doing and why am I doing this and what is this, what is this about? So I thought I would share my most frequently asked questions. Number one, what do you do when it gets wet? It gets wet and it dries just as slowly or quickly as hair on the human head. This little video is a behind the scenes video of that van in Penang. And as you can see, we had to work in torrential rain. And it wasn't fun. I mean, no one wants to work in torrential rain, but we made it work. We covered it and it drove around in unavoidable torrential rain and it survived. In fact, the irony is that the one thing that was threatening to this bus is the engine that blew up, caught on fire and burnt some of the knitting. So, as you can see, water is not my biggest challenge. The next question is, do you knit it all on site? That would mean that the illusion has worked on you. That would be impossible. Uh, if I were to knit on site, that would mean I would be camped out there for days, if not weeks, knitting the object in question before I ever actually covered it. So, my process goes this way. There are two phases. Phase one is the production of material. And then once I'm done with that, I move on to phase two, which is taking the material to the site and covering the object. That's the simplest of explanations. So I have to share with you the most popular comment that I get after 10 years of doing this. And people always feel so clever after they say this. That object must be really cold for you to want to wrap a sweater around it. Like, I've run out of things to say to that. I just, I'm like, if I had a dollar for every time I heard it. <laughs> um, and the last two questions that I get the most, and honestly, my favorite ones. Why knit an inanimate object when you could knit sweaters for the homeless? And it doesn't last forever, so why waste so much time doing it? That's exactly why I waste so much time doing it. This is the kind of artwork that 
is, has this ephemeral beauty that is experienced by whoever sees it. Yes, it fades, yes, it goes away, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't need to exist. So when I put my art out there in the urban environment, it's no longer mine, it's everyone's. And this can be applied to any street art. Street art. When you place it out into elements that you can no longer control, you have officially made it temporary. If you think about a street artist that paints a mural, that mural could be painted over the next day. But for that brief moment, that creative expression was shared by whoever saw it. So let me take a brief moment to talk about knitting for art versus function. If the first artist who worked with wood was told, you can't work with wood, wood is for building houses, or you can't work with clay, clay is for making bricks, we wouldn't have seen or, or known the greatest art, some of the greatest artists of our time. If I were told that I couldn't use knitting. Knitting is only allowed to be confined in a domestic environment where it's expected, unappreciated, and even sometimes exploited. I wouldn't be standing here today, and there wouldn't be the movement that exists now. But I get it. It's a very uncomfortable, crude juxtaposition to take a material that evokes memories of childhood for some people, or even a sweet grandmother, and to cover some ugly, dirty, crude object, like a fire hydrant, it's startling to some people. But what it also does is it engages that passerby or that viewer unexpectedly with their own environment. It makes them pay attention. There's a distinct thrill in discovering something that you didn't realize you were looking for. As we get older, we lose our capacity for astonishment, which is sad because the world is an astonishing place. We start believing that pessimism is deep and optimism is shallow. The one thing that art can do for us is bolster our spirits and help us see the good in life and help us face the challenges of the grimness sometimes of adulthood or even prolong the innocence and happiness of childhood. So, I... Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I'm fa fascinated about with this kind of work. I love, I'm fascinated by this idea of taking humble objects and putting fragile material on it, like balconies or steps. It's this inquiry in this nature of perception that really gets my heart pumping, because that's what I believe is art. Art to me is forcing the audience to engage in their own environment and having them reach their own conclusions. And sometimes that happens beneath the surface or beneath our consciousness. I can stand here and I can articulate only the top level of what I'm trying to do, but really the magic happens when it is experienced by the viewer without a narrative. For instance, when a child or even an adult comes up to a piece of mine Cover, like a bollard covered in knitting, I don't need to tell them what they need to experience or what they need to feel or even verbalize anything. They're having their own unique experience with that piece. So, going back to those strangers, I'm always a little disenchanted when I hear these people tell me, I don't know anything about art, therefore I can't appreciate it, which is completely false. I mean, if we said that about music, I mean, I don't play an instrument, and I could probably name five instruments off the top of my head, but that hasn't stopped me from thoroughly enjoying music all of my life. Art is not meant to keep the untrained eye out and the privileged or elite in, but the majority of people believe that. That is why art in public spaces is so vital. It brings art to the people. It makes it accessible. And that doesn't mean that it loses any of its validation. Art, as well as music, is just as worthwhile when it's free of hyperproduction or excessive frills or even an entrance fee. So, I'm from Texas. You may have noticed that from how shy and soft-spoken I am. But 
a lot of country music comes from Texas. And we have this saying that a good country song is made up of three chords and the truth. I try to apply this to my own work. For instance, this gun. Putting material that represents, really only represents love. I mean, you don't knit for hate. Or somebody could talk to me afterwards if they want to challenge that. You don't knit for hate, or at least I don't. So covering this object and symbolically obliterating it, this object that represents our instinct to kill and represents hate, that's a really strong message to make out of just a simple act. So my passion is deeply rooted in the struggle I wage with the limitations of this material that I'm so intimately involved with now. My challenge is striking a balance between revealing and concealing an object. I have failed if I have covered an object and that object loses its identity, or if I've covered an object and, it's, and I've paralyzed its original function. What I try to do is I try to seek balance between emotions or feelings or objects that seemingly contradict themselves, like brilliance and idiocy, or substantiality and frivolity. I try to find haphazard beauty in things that seem unimaginably rigid or orderly. So back to uh, knitting sweaters for the homeless. To put something out there in the urban arena without the intentions of profit is in itself an act of love. Art is an existential expression of being human and that doesn't have to be reduced to just making a bunch of practical stuff. Art doesn't have to last forever. As long as it touches even one person, it makes it completely worth it. Art, especially in public places, is laced with humanity and fragility that makes for something that's worth sharing. What if you strike up a conversation with someone, that stranger, staring at that same piece, and maybe you find something in common with that person, redefining a human connection that is really difficult to do in this culture and in this society. We don't meet people, we Facebook them. We don't date, we go online. So wouldn't it be refreshing to think for a brief moment you could stop and seek out what's in front of you and who's in front of you. I'll leave you with this art that I discovered here. It's called Water Books. It's when you take a brush and dip it in water and then write a story on the ground knowing that it will soon and quickly evaporate. Whoops. But that hasn't stopped this from lasting hundreds if not thousands of years. So China, you are the pioneers of semi-permanent artwork. So kudos to you. <laughs> and now I will leave you with Willie Nelson. Does anybody know who this person is or is it just me? Raise your hand if you know who Willie Nelson is. Awesome. As far as three chords and the truth goes, this man is a master of it. And I had the opportunity to Yarn Bomb, a hotel that he was performing at, and there is, we made a short little video of it. I'll let the video tell the rest.
believe it or not, that hotel really didn't know that we were doing that uh, to the W logo. Uh, but it, soon after, they kind of figured out that Willie's people told my people to do it. And you can't mess with Willie, so they, they had to embrace it. So anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. <laughs>